three, two, one. Boom. Welcome to episode nine of Core Office Hours, hosted by yours truly, Yoni Chong and Jose Caballero. Uh, we welcome you from wherever you are in the globe. We've got folks rocking from Germany, uh, South Africa, London, Brazil, South America. We see y'all. Glad to have you guys with us. So uh, today, Bienvenidos. yeah. Uh, today we're your facilitators. Um, we have the lovely Mary Gribben. Uh, Mary, if you want to say hey real quick. Hi everyone. And we've got Jose. Hello, hello. And was that my cue to say hi? <laughs> that was. Uh, and myself. Uh, so always, we ask for you to like and subscribe so we can continue to bring you this wonderful content. So today's episode, as always, is brought to you by CORE, which is Brand Strategy Foundations for Innovation. So what is CORE? Core Discovery is a simple way to help any brand understand, prioritize, and focus on a clear vision and plan to help them achieve their goals. It is branding for the 21st century. So Core, what it does is it brings brand alignment around the culture and the essence of who you are, your users and your customer needs, as well as your business goals. If this is, sounds interesting to you, check it out at coresmagic.com. So Core is a product of the system. What is the system? The system is a social learning experiment. It's tools, community, and guidance to empower the next generation of creative leaders and builders to redesign the world. So let's talk a little bit about our agenda for today. We're gonna to do the drop-in for about 15 minutes. Uh, then we're going to dive into the download, which is gonna relate, be related to our theme, which is this week, the theme of collaboration. Um, then we're gonna have Motto, um, if he's available, uh, he's going to review the last bit of his deck that we explored last week. Um, and we'll be looking a little bit at the uh, stylescapes that he created, the mood boards, and how that really translated into a lot of the deliverables that he ended up producing for the company. Uh, then we'll open up the conversation into collaboration. So uh, Maro will share some of the tips and benefits that he's had from having a partnership uh, with his client, like a collaborative partnership and what it took for him to build that. Let's uh, do an experiment too, because we also have Jeff here. The, yeah. the experiment is this, uh, I'm gonna ask, and this is a request from everybody who's attending. You definitely have questions about collaboration. We have two masters. We have Mauro Medina who trained under Jeff, uh, who's also here, Jeff Silva, uh, who trained under, uh, and, and, and Mauro also trained under Keone and under me. Like we've learned from each other, right? Um, what I wanted to request is that we ask questions before we actually go to Mauro or to anyone else uh, to show examples. Ooh, okay. And then that way we can show the uh, examples in context of the questions. Like any question about core, about how he did a really big project um, in Latin America that's an ongoing project, an ongoing relationship in Spanish. So for those of you who speak Spanish and he used core, he used a bunch of other strategy elements from other people. Um, and then just ask your questions about what you're struggling with right now in collaborations with your clients, etc. And then when Mauro gets to answer it, it'll be in context to your questions. So Mauro can share the story as it relates to, oh, Natasha, you're having this issue with a client or, you know, Roxana, you're having this issue, whoever it is. And that way we, we can keep it like really valuable. All right, that was like it. That. Yeah, no, that totally works. So um, let's dive into our drop-in. So today's drop-in, uh, and this is what we're going to really try to pull uh, the conversation from, is what is your biggest fear in collaborations? And I'll model that for you. So my name is Keone Chong. I'm located in Los Angeles. And what is my biggest fear in collaboration? Um, my biggest fear is when a client, I should just say this in general, my biggest fear is when we don't have the same set of values, when the culture doesn't match. Um, because in those situations, uh, I find myself sacrificing some part of my value system to try to create uh, 
a happy outcome in the relationship. And if I had just focused on values early on, um, or really taking the time to explore the values and make sure the values were aligned, uh, I feel like I wouldn't have those challenges. So that's my biggest fear. Um, and let's open up the floor. Mary, would you like to take it next? Sure. Um, yeah, I, 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 that resonates with me too, Keone. Um, can we turn the volume of the music down so just a tiny bit, please? Yeah, unless you have headphones, it's hard to, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that, re that relate, I relate to that a lot. I mean, and, and so just to like dovetail on that, I would say that, um, you know, the consciousness around collaboration, um, mm -hmm. doing it really consciously and mindfully, it, that's it, not being with people who are in that same, you know, mindset, mm -hmm. for sure, is my biggest fear. Um, so that, you know, the, the, uh, the collaboration is, can flow and everyone can be seen and heard um, that's participating. Mm. I love that. Would anyone else like to come to this stage and share some of their fears in collaboration? Don't be shy. Uh, I can go next. Okay. Um, I think one of my biggest fears when I'm doing core uh, is I think misinterpreting uh, misinterpreting the uh, the why, or not really being able to extract the um, I don't want to say like the truth, um, but the legitimate uh, reasons why the client may be doing the the business, or you know, if it's if this uh, is this really truthful? All this information that I'm getting and I'm interpreting. Um, I think that is one of my, my biggest fears and understanding how I can possibly remedy that or, you know, that I'm making sure that I'm not uh, doing, for example, like the opposite of what his true intentions really are. Mm. Shared vision. So important. Yeah. Anybody else? I might just call on you. Shaquille, I know you're going through interesting partnerships right now. Jeff was going to say something too before oh, we... Oh, Jeff, were... jump on board, Jeff. Yeah. yeah, I think to me, and it's, it's not, I would say it's not necessarily a fear, but it's a goal that, that I strive for. Um, and that is like true, like synergy and connection with my client, right? And I think in building trust, right? Because I think when um, you have built in trust, with your client, then the success of the project, you know, the chances of success with a project kind of increase, you know, mm -hmm. um, and are magnified dramatically. Um, and then it's also, you know, it, it's really what's what's great about what we do. It's the relationship is so important, right? I mean, you are, you know, working with this client inside and out. Um, and and you need to kind of have that kind of fidelity and trust um with them to, to make it a successful um journey and process right we always say that you know in the work that we do right like the the results you know will be the results but it, what we really learn from truthfully is like the journey with, with people yeah man i love that thank you for sharing hania Yes, um, I want to say also that it's not necessarily fear, but um, when I'm doing core to my customers and moving forward, I want to keep all the time the interest alive. So I'm trying really to be dynamic and all the time really I'm 100% with, with my customer mm -hmm. to always try to extract more of the words that the person is saying. So I'm, I'm really moving forward because when we are working with the adjectives to get more or less the words, I'm trying to go more in deep to really satisfy my customer, to create the trust and really to promote changes. So it's, it's not yeah, clear, no. but it's more engagement. Yeah, you know, I, I can totally relate to that. 
my early stages of practicing core, I was really concerned about being able to channel the true meaning, you know, of what, what your partner is saying, like the true understanding. I mean, to be able to see that um, and articulate and build on that. Um, I'm going to read a couple from the audience and then we're going to move on. Uh, so we've got Shaquille, who's in Seattle. His biggest fear is working with collaborators that have no desire to improve the status quo. They're jaded, checked out, or apathetic. Mm, I can feel that one. Uh, I've also experienced it when they are in a position where they feel like any misstep could possibly uh, impact their job. And so they won't take the risk of, you know, doing the work that needs to get done, knowing that there's significant possibility of failure, but also significant possibility of like growth and learning from that. Uh, but yeah, I totally feel that. We've got Natasha in Savannah, Georgia. Her biggest fear is collaborating with super quiet or introverted, introverted folks who are not familiar with collaboration. So you find that you have to keep personally reaching out for feedback and engagement. Mm. Cassie really felt that one. Arsenije in Belgrade, Serbia. When the client doesn't understand the customer needs. You have had a client like that. Yeah. All right. So let's jump into the Q&A. Uh, Mato said that he would be right back. So, you know, he'll, he'll jump in when he returns. But what I'd like to do is open up the floor and talk about what are the challenges that we've had in core and in uh, Q&A. Uh, I'd like for you guys to, you know, voice those and, and open up the uh, discussion around those things. Uh, we'd like to be able to see how they apply maybe to your personal situations or your personal projects that you're struggling with uh, and see if we can offer some value. I'm you. I was just saying that, uh, yeah, step up. It's uh, We're here. It's just us. What questions do you have about court? I'm sure you have a ton, including, you know, um, Pape, you know, you have questions. Ana Diaz, the new folks. Jaja just hopped off a of mute. Hi. Hey. Uh, my, so the core process is running so well is my uh, current client mm -hmm. and they really like the process. They really feel like they, they understand themselves more and more every, every time they hang out with me. Um, so now I have this question, but I'm not, I'm not sure whether or not it's related to core. Um, is the question where they want to position this sub brand. Um, so they don't have a name for it. They they want to they want my help to help them to figure out you know, their brand name. So is that how how does that work? Is is that related to core? Can I use some of core attributes to help us to sort of inspire to come out with name? I mean, what what do you think? What's your thoughts? Mm, good one. I have a whole naming. Uh, uh, doc that I've shared with people who have asked me this question, um, like how to take core and, and I can do it more in story format, but um, I'll tell you the the, the short answer uh, of that just so that, and while I'm saying this, you guys should think of other questions that uh, might be related. Thank you, Jaja, for asking it. So we, we had to do naming a few times for startups, right? And we did the core process for them. So we have all these attributes. So one of the things, and I learned some of this at Razorfish, uh, to come up with naming successfully. Naming is super hard because you need to have the domain, you need to have it be memorable, and you need to have it be, you know, related to the brand and to the idea. It can't just be super random. So, so those three factors in itself just make it super uber difficult sometimes to come up with a name. You might find a name, but it doesn't have a domain. You might find, you know, this, but it doesn't, you know, sound related enough, etc. So the way that we did the naming is we put the whole team, including the client, in a room in a facilitated session where we had all the core um, uh, attributes kind of printed really big. And then we, in addition to that, took each of the voice attributes, the ones that determine the personality most and the impact attributes, the ones that are in the current kit that are the that are the uh, 
the ones uh, recommended for and how Mauro used it. And Mauro, this is what you can share is how you use the um, uh, attribute clustering to create like this sequencing. Those would be slides that would be great to show to Jaja. Um, so we basically, from those three categories, took uh, from the impact, let's say, like, you know, what uh, a, a client gives. Um, we took and we did Spanish, Italian, any Romance language, French variations of all of them. And then we printed them out individually. You can do this now in Mural. Uh, so we put all those names up. Keep in mind, the client's in the room and the output, the outcome we want is a name. Uh, but then what we started to do is since we had them all printed out, like all the synonyms, uh, we did synonyms and language derivations to each attribute. So we had a lot of, of uh, attributes. Uh, or a lot of names or a lot of ideas. And they weren't final names, they were just words. So then we took them off the board and we put them on the table and we cut them together and we um, you know, did uh, different iterations of it. The business's name was, it was a rename, not a sub-brand uh, of a business called Stylet, uh, called uh, Fashion Smashers. That was the, the idea, the, it was a startup. But Fashion Smashers just sounds weird and kind of a little bit aggressive. So uh, on all of the uh, permutations from the attributes, you know, one of the words was style and the other one was literature. It was a synonym for one of the uh, components, uh, one of the brand attributes, um, meaning that it was a website for content about fashion. Uh, so the word literature came up uh, or literary. Um, and from all those words and options, we just looked at them and then somebody was, looking for the registration at the same time. Like, can we register this name? So we would have a, a, a queue of the names that we were liking, like on the board, we would put the ones that we liked and we got like to 10 of them. And at the same time, we searched for whether they were available and some of them were, some of them weren't, some of them had different variations in how they were. And it was like, woo, when we found register, ones that we could register. But style and literature, we put those two words together and then we cut it and it came out to style it and it was available at the time. So so okay. just with that going really wide uh, and coming up with a lot of different names based on direct uh, attribution from uh, from attributes, meaning like these were directly related to the attributes in the form of synonyms and other language variations, um, gave us a bunch of cool names and uh, that we could have used almost any of them. And uh, the client was just like blown away that we could do that in two hours. Because usually naming cost and takes a lot of time to do that. You know, companies just do, there's companies that just do naming for, for brands. Um, so that's my story. Um, and oh my God, that is so useful. Thank you so much. I mean, we have set up a meeting on Friday with all the clients. Um, so I'll do exactly um, what you're suggesting. Uh, Cause I, I had this idea in my head, but I, I just wasn't sure, but now you actually confirmed it. So thank you very much. I, I, give, it, I give it a go on Friday. I'll let you know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Jose. Has anyone had an experience in uh, naming? Yes, I, I actually, my, my the last core I did, uh, the mm -hmm. first deliverable was a naming. And I, I did something similar to what Jose was saying, but I didn't do it in two hours. It took me like two weeks. Uh, <laughs> I, I just I just went one of the attributes was connected to it was connected to their environment like to the surroundings and it's it's a real estate project that is on an island in Panama so I took that attribute and I mixed it with another and I started just looking to for the environment like plants and you get all these Latin words for naming plants and from that we like, even in, in getting synonyms of islands, of bay and everything, it, it was just like going again really wide, but from the attribute is, is my first lead to for direction. So I opened that and I went really, really wide. And then in collaboration, uh, we, we, we couldn't meet. So it was just like choosing our favorite words. And, and then at the end, all of the people that were on the core, the five people, we all chose the same three best name the, the the same names we showed them and it was really easy to just like look mm -hmm. look for it and they were available so it was quite fun that's amazing 
And Keone, I, I want to ask Mauro and, and redirect the energy to uh, the question from Jaime Araya. And uh, he's basically starting out uh, as a graduate. He graduated in graphic design and struggling yeah. with the, getting the values. And then there's also the question from Adriana in Mexico. And this is a conversation we had with Mauro that in Latin America, that clients might not be as sophisticated about what branding is or in other communities or in smaller you know, neighborhoods and smaller uh, ideas. So how do we, you know, and we have Samuel from Corvus here, how do we start a conversation about being more strategic and being more grounded and the confidence to have como gente de, de diaspora de Latinoamérica con, la, con, con el, el, el mismo valor y la misma, uh, el mismo entendimiento que tenemos aquí en los Estados Unidos that we have here in the United States of the sophistication of being brand driven versus just being tactical in the design of things. How do we start that conversation? How is the relationship between, you know, how did you not convince, but how did you work with someone like Samuel, who's an entrepreneur and, and really focused to bring up that conversation with your clients? That's, that's a big, big thing. Energy forward to that, so Mauro. Um, okay. In so that's, way. in Espanol or in English? Uh, I learn in Spanish to get it, but we have a Spanish and English audience, so do, do English first. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that is actually a pretty long answer. Um, and back to everybody, I present you Samuel, it's right here, the owner of Corvus. So I think he can reaffirm a lot of the, the things that I have to say, uh, specifically about branding and what we've done together uh, to move you know, this company forward. Um, but I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna answer the first question, uh, which is how do you have this conversation about strategy in Latin America and how to kind of change uh, that way of, that really old style way of thinking. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, actually I'm, I'm gonna be starting another, another project. We're, we're doing a, a bar in San Quintin, which is like an even smaller town than Ensenada. And we're dealing with these uh, investors who are very, very business oriented. They're just, oh, well, I want what this guy's doing and that's it. Like, this is gonna work, it's gonna be amazing. Um, and one of the things that, I, right, that I've tried to do is, okay, well, that's fine, that's great. Yes, it's, it's, it's a great idea, it's a great direction, but have you thought about this and this and this? How is, this specific logo, how is this specific ambient, how is this specific lighting going to affect the people that you're going to be bringing in, and really trying to focus on the culture that's that uh, that's that it's affecting the, and the culture that you're trying to attract as well, right? That's this specific direction. Is it how is that moving uh, your clientele? It, are they going to like it? Are they going to maybe eventually uh, move on to something else? So it's really understanding. Uh, cultural context when you're doing branding here, which is something that um, people don't really think about. I think they, they get really stuck and they just want to do something that something else, that somebody else is doing. And they just want to follow that and maybe change it a little bit. And the question, what you have to uh, align them to is asking the question, why, right? Why are you doing this? Why are you changing this? Why are you trying to, to copy this other person, this other company? And um, it's, it's one of those questions that not many have a, a good answer for. And this is where you come in and you're just like, well, let me help you with that. Let me show you this specific direction. This, let me show you why this matters. Let me show you why you should be looking at, at this and this and this different uh, direction. How can you, you know, move people into your business and rather than throwing a big net into the ocean, let's just focus it on to, you know, this little school of fish right here and let's just focus on that. From there, you can start to grow. Um, really, that is uh, what we did with the Corvus. So when I came into to Corvus, uh, they were throwing a big net into, into everybody and trying to see what they, what they caught, which is fine when you're starting a business, but you have to start to focus. And right when you focus it is when you really, you can really focus that energy, really focus on a, on a specific market and then you start to grow them. You can go into different directions, right? You can change the marketing, you can change the product, you can make adjustments. And that is really one of the ways that, that we uh, started with Corvus. Um, 
when I, when I got started, I know Samuel was really, really thoughtful strategy and he could not visualize it. Um, when we did it, we back to the concept, we, I understood where, where everything stand, um, where we were. And I had to do a bit of a backwards engineering with the naming, right? So I, rather than changing the name, I was like, okay, well, why is Godwood? Why did they, where did it start? What's, what's the origin of it? When I found out, you know, this was this really beautiful uh, story behind it. I was like, okay, let's, let's keep it, but let's do it responsibly. Let's, let's make changes that really affect the name and, and drive people into understanding where the brand is coming from and how people can connect with it. Um, after we started doing that and we started changing for the, the image into something that really matched the aesthetic and the heart of, of, the, of Corvus, that's when someone started to really understand, oh, okay, I'm seeing the value now. I'm seeing how people are connecting to things that were super, super specific, I mean, whether they were photos or colors or you know, the language that we're using in marketing. Um, he started to really understand where I was, where I was going until we got to the point, to the place where we're at right now. You're also doing that really slowly. I'm curious to hear from Samuel, you know, what your over time, kind of like your reaction from the beginning, you know, what was your journey of, as you got more uh, understanding of what Mauro was doing y que no era brujería, <laughs> que, que, como te sentías as an entrepreneur and, and as, a, as a founder to have a designer like Mauro on your team? In English and Espanol. Do it in English first for our English audience, and you, or you can do it in Spanish. Cualquiera de los dos. Uh, my English not very well, but uh, uh, I'll in español y yo te lo traduzco. Okay. Oh. <coughs> eh, voy haciendo pausas para que traduzcas. Sí, por favor. Okay. Cuando conocí a Mauro, supe que él era la persona indicada. Esa es una historia para entrar. Ah, era para la, otro día, exacto. Era, era la indicada porque en su foto de perfil tenía un cuervo en su brazo. <laughs> It, he knew it was Mauro who he needed to work with because when he saw his profile picture, he had a crow. Okay. Y Corvus se llama, Corvus es, se llama Corvus porque es cuervo en latín y era el ave o el animal favorito de mi hijo. Mm, and uh, the name Corvus uh, stands for crow in Latin, which was the favorite animal of his son. Okay. Que falleció hace cinco años. Who passed away five years ago. Uh, Cuando Mauro me dijo que todo necesitaba salir de la estrategia, yo no sabía que era una estrategia. When Mauro told him that everything needed to come from strategy, he had no idea what strategy was in this case. Eh, entonces eh, hicimos el trabajo de estrategia y entendí un poco mejor cuál es el trabajo que se tenía que hacer. Then we did the work, we did the strategy session, and we understood, I understood better now what the role of this was and what we needed to do. Porque en mi caso, cuando se inició Corvus um, como una startup, no sabíamos, copiábamos estrategias de otras compañías como Warby Parker, Ben and Frank, y ese tipo. No teníamos nuestra propia identidad. When we started, you know, we were a startup, so we were just copying the strategies of other people in the same space, like Warbly Parker or, you know, the other online glasses retailers. We were just copying them. Pero cuando me entregó el, eh, los papeles de la estrategia, yo le dije, Mauro, pero no quiero un papel que se quede debajo de mis archivos. Necesito que esto se haga realidad. Yeah, when he gave him the whole strategy deck, he's like, well, I don't need a deck, you know, that I'm going to put under my, my desk. I need something that, that comes to reality. So he needed to execute against it. Okay. Eh, y pues poco a poco, al ir implementando la estrategia, me pude dar cuenta que es como realmente se puede hacer y posicionar una marca con tu propia identidad. So uh, he learned, you know, that it was the, the right way of how you can position your brand and your identity uh, in a unique way in the market and not just copy the competitors. Y a medida que íbamos implementando la estrategia, eran, fue necesario, o me di cuenta que el equipo y la colaboración tenía que ser más grande cada vez. And what he realized that as they started implementing the strategy that the team and the 
and the uh, the people had to be bigger and bigger and the collaboration had to become bigger and bigger. Aquí en México se acostumbra que el dueño hace la mercadotecnia, hace el diseño, hace la venta, la operación. In Mexico, it's, you know, very common for entrepreneurs to do everything, to do marketing, sales, the design, like, you know, be outside, you know, put on the apron, put on the glasses, like, you know, there's this, there's a mentality of you have to do all of it. Entonces, eh, era necesario cambiar un poco la mentalidad. Y ese es un problema, yo creo, que las personas que ayudan en la parte de estrategia o de diseño con la parte del, del dueño o el emprendedor, porque es invertir en mucha gente cuando la empresa apenas está saliendo, los, el dinero es, es muy difícil. Entonces, la gente de estrategia quiere hacer muchas cosas, pero el, el, el dueño no tiene el cash flow para estarlo haciendo. Oh, wow. So, what he just said is actually like such a huge insight. For an entrepreneurial uh, founder like me, or he's saying in Mexico for entrepreneurial founders, you know, seeing all of the stuff that comes out from the strategy work, let's say, from, you know, revenue and awareness, et cetera, it scares the Jesus out of them because they think now that they have to pay for all these things yep. and that they have to do all these things. So it's kind of like, oh no, uh, you open the portal to too much versus me saying, this is what I need to do because I know how much money I have, which is a very good insight saying like, <laughs> look, these are just ideas. We're not going to do all of them, uh, but here are the ones that we need to focus on so that you don't scare your clients in Latin America. Or agile, by the way, um, go ahead. Agile, agile pricing and agile exactly. process. Keep in mind that that's actually not just for Latin America. Uh, that is the same here. It mm -hmm. doesn't even it doesn't even matter. Like if you put in front of a founder all of these options, or they come out, the reason why they want to keep control or maintain control of the strategy or not have a strategy at, at all is so that they can keep control of what gets done. That's actually one of the techniques, and and and, and I'm guilty of it myself. That the more that you share the strategy and the more you share the big vision the more that you now have to execute against it and, and you might not have the cash flow to do it. So Samuel, that's a very good, a muy buen insight. Pero sigue. Um, I, I, sí, uh, just, a, just a quick note on that. Um, so based, based on that, and I remember the conversations that I used to have with, with Samuel specifically about, you know, bringing in talent and bringing in new people and, and you know, the cash flow was not there and we couldn't hire anybody. Um, it was a very, very slow process, right? So we had to scaffold very, very, very uh, slowly. Uh, one of the things that I tried to implement was, okay, well, let's systematize what we have right now, which was just polished, the, the polished uh, um, identity system. And then from there, just very slowly work ourselves up to hiring our first like marketer and then, and then hiring a... Uh, Saul, uh, our photographer, who is actually here in the in the audience, um, but is is taking some time and it's taking right a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of energy, a lot of conversations, and a lot of a lot of our talent has started with us in a very very minimal capacity, right? So they just doing a couple of posts, maybe a month, you know, maybe just one session of photography. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of stuff is also to kind of bet, bet them and make sure that they can work with, with us and they can work at the level that we need them to, um, but also to know that they're the right person. Culture and then, fit. Right, and exactly. And it took, it took some time, but right now mm -hmm. we're, we're a super strong team and we work extremely well together. And there's a lot of communication. There's a lot, a lot of things get done. There's... The collaboration is 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 huge, and we love to collaborate. And everybody throws ideas back and forth. And there's uh, right. I'm just direct. I'm just guiding the boat, but everybody else is contributing to everything that's happening. Mm -hmm. I have a question about collaboration for both you and Samuel. You know, as it relates to Latin America. Tengo una pregunta para ambos de ustedes cómo se relaciona Latinoamérica. And and this is. This Ay, is really... mierda, chúme la pinga. Okay, like uh, we need to remove that person. Um, hold on one second. Uh, that was yeah, there we go. Then uh, it's a uh, iPhone X. Hold on. IPhone. iPhone X, yeah, and it's, it's shut up, fucking nigger. <laughs> okay. All right. Did you get it? 
<laughs> it's like whack-a-mole. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a game of whack-a-mole. Oh my God, that's good. Oh, well, okay. Well, <laughs> you you know you know that that you're getting popular when um, when that happens. When we're starting to get, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, I shouldn't have let an iPhone X in. Uh, but here, here the la, la razón por la pregunta, because we have a lot of people in, and in the chat, if you can say, oh, we have penis drawings. That's excellent. Um, I, <laughs> Vaya de mierda. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so <laughs> all the, all the, all the, all the new join, the new joiners are actually uh, uh, not, don't let anybody in if you have um Sorry about that, guys. Uh, Zoom bomb. Yeah, there we go. Patience. Whack-a-mole. Uh, oh, that's the first time for it. It's, it's, yeah. it's the second one, actually. Um, oh. uh, 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 it's still in there. Not done yet. Who else do we need to perch? Hema. Hema. Uh, Hemi, though. Uh, no, Hema. Hema is good. Okay, Hema is actually. Okay, cool. Okay. Cool. All right, cool. friends. Friends, who's friends? Who's friends of the tribe? So the question was, la pregunta is, you know, in, in terms of collaboration as you've scaled, what are the things that you feel, Samuel and, 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 and Mauro, that to, how has the strategy or having it as a central item helped your teams and your growth? Because there's, there's, there's working on small projects with just one-on-one -on -one with clients, which a lot of us do. Um, but then if you're going to scale and if you're going to do bigger projects for entrepreneurs who are doing what you're doing, Samuel, uh, in, 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 in Ensenada, you're, you're actually using a model that has worked in the United States, you know, in terms of, you know, how you have glasses being retailed online and you're bringing it, you're bringing innovation into Mexico. Um, and, and one thing that I've said to Mauro, we were having dinner here at my house, uh, el salchichón no la dejan, el salchichón, oh man, that's an easy one not to let in. That's so <laughs> easy. Um, the, uh, the, uh, what I told Mauro is that what you're doing in Ensenada is actually such an amazing example of how we can collaborate between designers and entrepreneurs. Uh, when you can bring, uh, cuando se puede traer el, el, la experiencia estratégica que tiene en Mauro a través de tres personas que están aquí, porque Mauro ha sido estudiante de Kioni Chong, mío y de, y de Jeff Silva, que, que viene de una mucha experiencia and marketing and design for products. So you're getting the benefits, Samuel. You have the experience, you have the experience of all that experience in the United States in Ensenada through Mauro. Um, how, how has that affected the scaling of your business? How has that affected the growth of your business and your confidence in doing the business with more clarity, Samuel? It's interesting. Como te comenté al principio, cuando empezamos, que no estaba Mauro, copiábamos nosotros estrategias de otras empresas. Ahora, hoy en día, con nuestra estrategia, ya las demás empresas nos empiezan a copiar a nosotros. Wow. So that's really powerful. Before, when they were starting, they copied other companies. And now that there are other companies are copying them. Y cuando sucede eso, Sabes que lo estás haciendo muy bien. And when that happens, you know you're doing it well because other people are copying you. Pero aquí entra algo importante de un libro que leí que se llama ¿Qué es ser digital? Um, and this is something that comes in now that's really important from a book I read, which is What does it mean to be digital? Al principio, yo soy ingeniero en cibernética. Al principio pensé que ser digital tenía que ver con unos y ceros. Uh, I'm an engineer, I'm a computer science major, and uh, I thought that uh, that uh, being digital meant zeros and ones. Pero descubrí en ese libro que no tiene nada que ver digital con unos y ceros. Ser digital lo definía como ser ágiles y rápidos. So he realized and he learned that being digital had nothing to do with zeros and ones, that it had everything to do with being agile and being fast iterations. Ágil en la, ágil en generar ideas y rápidos en ponerlas en práctica. Uh, agile in generating ideas and um, uh, being able to put them into practice quickly. Porque cuando haces eso, no le, da, no le permites a la competencia que te alcance. 
when you're doing that, you're not letting the competition re catch up to you because you're always innovating. Porque cuando te están copiando algo, tú ya vas 10 pasos adelante. When they're copying what you just put out, you're already halfway through uh, the next thing that you're about to release. Entonces, ese es lo importante de tener una colaboración grande porque puedes ir así de rápido. Uh, so the importance of having a lot of collaborators is that you can actually go faster. Lo importante también en México es dejar pensar que el dueño tiene toda la razón y confiar en tu equipo. And the thing that uh, in Mexico is important to learn is uh, that, the, that the owner has all of, you know, it's right all the time, but to just let go of that and trust your team. Entonces, eso es lo que yo he hecho, confiar en Mauro, y Mauro ha crecido el equipo para que se pueda implementar todo lo que hemos hecho con la estrategia. Wow, so that's what he's done. He's trusted Mauro to help him grow the team. Uh, so that we can implement everything that we came up in the strategy. And this comes to a very important point, a juncture in our conversation about growth and about collaboration for all of us, Latin America and beyond. Y Samuel, lo que estoy diciendo es, esto viene, tú lo entiendes en inglés, así que no tengo que traducir lo que estoy diciendo. Sí. So the, the, the juncture here is the designer as the guide strategically and in the growth of the marketing and the digital initiatives of a company. Keep in mind, Samuel is a computer science major. He's a developer, he's a coder, he can build anything and he can do it really fast, right? And that's the advantage that built that business. So there's a, already there a key advantage. Now you have Mauro, who's the flaky creative. You have the dorky, you know, engineer, and now you have other people marketing and, you know, other components. Uh, and now you begin to see the full spectrum of a team and the need for collaboration becomes essential. But the model that I, that I want to point out to is that the catalyst for this is a designer. So, so when I keep on saying that we will, right brainers will own the future, when I keep on saying, when we keep on saying, you know, this mindset of uh, infinite, you know, game or the mindset of growth inside our skill sets and our confidence to lead that Keone and I keep on like saying, it's for this very reason. It's for the, the result that is being seen in Mauro returning to Ensenada and being able to bring everything that he learned from the journey with Jeff Silva from Johnson and Johnson uh, and all and in consensus, the experience that Mauro had a consensus of doing startups over and over again and understanding engineers. So now he can have a relationship with Samuel because he had a bunch of relationships with engineers. So this is the point I think of this conversation and relationship around collaboration is first and foremost to celebrate, so snap to everybody. Um, if you have your mics to celebrate and, and, and to honor and to see how we can support. And this is a question for Samuel and for Mauro. How can this community support what you guys are doing in Ensenada? ¿Cómo esta comunidad puede eh, eh, apoyarlos en cualquier cosa, en lo que sea? Eh, repetir el mensaje de Corbis más a través del mundo, eh, lo, que, lo que ustedes necesitan. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué necesitan y qué puede hacer una comunidad como la nuestra para ustedes? Mauro. Um, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat one more? Uh, well, well, what, 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 what can, so I'll give you an example to, to model the question. So the reason I'm asking how can the, this community support what you and Samuel are doing in Ensenada is as follows. Uh, imagine if, and we talked about this here at dinner, which if there is a Zoom or in-person conference in Ensenada highlighting the role of entrepreneurship, technology, and design in innovation in Latin America, you know, whatever we call it, and uh, you know, Keone and I have produced such things in the past. Uh, and, uh, and then sponsored by Corvus, but really in partnership with our communities to bring people to speak about innovation in Latin America. And suddenly now you have a platform to share the story of Corvus in Latin America uh, a través de un mensaje acerca de, de, de eh, desarrollo y, y colaboración y oportunidades para Latinoamérica en el, en el mundo de innovación. Uh, it's, it's, that's an, a, a point. How can we support you guys? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, really, I think. Um, I mean, I think the answer is super general. I mean, in any way that anybody can. Um, you know, I think I'm constantly looking for for new collaborators. I'm always looking for people who can add value, uh, new insights, new philosophies that I can help to implement to, into Corvus and to every, everything else that I do here in Mexico. 
Um, one of one of the things, uh, speaking about collaboration and bringing this sort of talent together, right? Uh, I want to start to build a, a, my own community here in, in Mexico of creatives in, internationally and be able to bring in all this, this, these perspectives into places that need these new perspectives and fresh eyes uh, and new ideas. Um, this is one way that I can I can see, right? So everybody collaborating and, and essentially, right? placing people into teams or into specific projects. Um, I think it is something that right, everybody should be doing in their own communities, in their own, in their own countries. Um, but really that, that's where my mind is in terms of like how we can begin to collaborate. Um, there's always a way of like, just send me a message. I'm more than happy to always jump into anything new if anybody has any help or even if anybody here has any sort of comments or any uh, new ideas that they want to be able to uh, add into into portal I mean, that is something that I would be eternally grateful. I'd be more than happy to see how we can work together to uh, continue to advance all this this culture. Revolutionary, revolutionized design. That's the goal. There it is. It's amazing. I want everybody to ask questions for somewhere and then for Mauro. I know I've been hogging the, yeah. the limelight and the, leading the conversation. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm very touched. Scola had a question. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Jose. Uh, Scola, okay. I know you were typing it, but if you want to just dive into it. Or I'll read it for him. So Scola, he has a job on the table with rebranding a city. The challenge is creating a way to use a core framework to build the way to use core to build a framework with so many stakeholders. How many stakeholders did you have, Mauro? Yeah. And someone, well, how many people were at the table when you were doing? And, and just to add to that, thank you, Keone. Uh, Jose, if, if you recall, I had actually inboxed you about that particular thing mm -hmm. and you uh, suggested that I post it on the tribe. And actually, uh, just, just a shout out to Patricia because she's actually a part of this project with me. So she's kind of spearheading this project with me. Um, but I think that the challenge that we're, 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 we're facing is, I don't believe it's, I, well, I haven't met anyone as, as of yet that has used CORE in, in a similar uh, atmosphere. So that's, oh, you have? You have? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. I have. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, so any insight or any guidance as to how we can uh, keep it from becoming chaotic through this process, but still getting the necessary uh, information that we need to build out that framework and execute would be uh, uh, very helpful to the project. Yeah, I'll give you something that's also related to both Latin America, but also to any civic or community-based projects. Um, and it's the understanding of the political and the mechanics of influence inside, you know, uh, government or inside communities, right? Nonprofits are like this and other organizations that are not businesses have a lot of consensus driven mechanisms, meaning they want people to agree and they have Robert's rules of orders, which you should know a little bit about how, you know, how to be a chairperson of a board, wherever you listen to everybody equally, you set the time, everybody gets to speak. There's this cadence to how government and functions, uh, the rituals are very specific and are a little bit more formal than entrepreneurship and, and startups. Like I can go wild with a startup and like have it be chaotic and it, the startup people are, woo, they're used to it. Uh, governmental and like, you know, nonprofit people are a little bit more staid and a little bit more formal and they're protecting themselves politically because in that environment, there's a lot of Caesaring going on, meaning like, you know, like stabbing behind the backs. Uh, so you wanna come very prepared. You wanna coach them. You don't wanna use the name core. It's not core. You're doing a discovery session to understand their needs better. And if you want to then equate it to what their cultural context is, which is like a board meeting, but you say this will be a facilitated session where everyone will get an opportunity to share their point of view. And then you can kind of run it like a very formal, like, you know, the gentleman from, you know, this and, and, and Susan, and then and you call one person at a time so that they take order instead of letting them contribute. Uh, you also acknowledge that, you know, you, are uh, learning and understanding and would like to know better how best to work with them. So even in the process of closing the sale, and this is a question, is the sale closed or you're just in the process? Do you have a contract that's signed? 
I don't have the contract signed, but it is scheduled to be signed on the 26th. Got it. Beautiful. So this yeah. is actually a lead that is being uh, uh, that is in progress. So yes. as you prepare to have the contract be signed, you know, you send the preparation materials with the agendas for your session, how many hours, how many days you might need it to be. It's going to be difficult and it's going to have to be scheduled really ahead of time uh, to do it. Governments and like nonprofits and corporate even clients have two weeks out to schedule calendaring for executives. So you have to be very buttoned up with your communications. I am following up based on our previous communication. And now I would like, you know, here's the agenda, you know, et cetera. Let us know if you have feedback and input, we'll make any changes. Schedule a call with the person that is your contact. Make sure that you have somebody internally who is your sponsor. In the case of scenario, Mauro has someone who's the founder and it's, an, and it's a startup. So that's very direct access to decision making. You yep. might not have that, so you need to I make actually, sure. Actually, my my point of contact is the mayor. So oh, I actually damn. Yeah, okay. Okay. Right, right. There you go. Then I actually go. worked on how, how the job came about. I actually worked on this campaign, and obviously won, we won because he's the new mayor. So he got a chance to see how I work. And Patricia and I actually came up with a strategy of, of I've already. So it's a two part situation. They actually want to make the internal of the, the city as a service provider more efficient, as well as package the city and create a brand that the community can get behind. So it's kind of two part. It's a business uh, goal as well as attract. And I guess the whole thing is business goal because they're trying to attract uh, a tourist and, e and economic growth here as well. So um, I think uh, we're excited about the opportunity is just thinking through the project and making sure that we Utilize and by the way, I don't I don't use core when I say it. I say strategy session or something of, of that nature. So we've already done the uh, the brand attribute exercise with them, which got them totally excited, and and that's that's where we at with that. But what I want to do is also obviously to create a brand for a city. You have to not only uh, deal with the top as far as the mayor and the council and all of these people, but you also have to get input from the citizens who actually live here the uh, tourists who have actually been here and then culminate that into something that, that is true to the city and true to, to what we're trying to build. So that's what I was trying to get some insight as yeah. to how we can use CORE to, to, to help facilitate that, if that well, makes Mar sense. Mary will have some insights in this. Uh, Mary, uh, if you can talk to a few things. One, like if we're doing internal and external stakeholders, working to schedule both, hey, we're gonna do a session for strategy with the internal stakeholders, the mayor and a few of the executives. You might do separate sessions for people that might not be able to be in the room at the same time. And then you actually request someone to support you to do a community session where you invite people and you post it on public forums. It's gonna take longer to do this project, just to be clear. And you wanna give it a nice long timeline you know, to, to, to do that. And you wanna make sure that your payment schedules are you know, nice and prolonged because uh, uh, municipalities have a lot of red tape in terms of payment and contracts. But when they move, they move fast. So, so this is a real both. You know, congratulations um, uh, uh, and 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 good luck because, as my CFO used to say, it ain't signed until it's signed. <laughs> um, and uh, Mary, the idea of like, how? Do, what are good tips for breaking up? groups into groups or like using stickies so that you can have different groups doing things. Any insights into the facilitation of this? Um, yeah, I mean, are, are you able to get together or are you doing it all virtually or what? First, I guess this is my first question. Well, I think, I think uh, implementation of both, uh, yeah. both uh, yeah. virtual and in-person. We did, we did the, the first brand attribute exercise with the top level, level execs and including the mayor in my office. So that was in person, but I yeah. imagine some of those will have to be done be, be done virtually. Yeah, so just replicate what you did without giving away what the results were for the other stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. Online, like in the in a virtual white, whiteboard like Miro or Mural or whatever. You, you could even just create the framework documents, right? I think Jose, aren't they part of Discovery anyway? Some of those, yeah. So you could just create like Google Docs of those. And then I would, you know, just make sure there's that that level of fidelity between both what you facilitated with the group in person and what you do online because you want to be able to see how it all comes together, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and then you may need to do some follow up that wherever there's like 
some discrepancies or like there's, you know, lack of alignment between the groups, right? Mm -hmm. To resolve anything, but um, that's how I would approach it. And sometimes you can even do it with, you could even provide like homework for people to do um, asynchronously if you can't get them all. Like sometimes certain stakeholders, they just won't have, you just can't get them all doing it at the same time. So, right. so, so just, yeah. just to speak to that point, Mary, is it Mary, right? Am I correct? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, first of all, thank you for that information. Just to, to speak to that point and give a little more context to it. Uh, my plan is to actually do the brand attribute exercise, which I, I think I've separated into five particular uh, groups within the city that, that pretty much hold weight as far as shaping the, the brand of the city. And then yeah. taking those five uh, top attributes that I come up with and then giving it to the general public to then have input to say, you know, so, yeah. so I just, yeah, right, right. Maybe you could do surveys too. So yeah, that's what he says he's doing, Mary. He's basically right. going to take the attributes and he's going to survey them out to the public. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, you could also do it internally as surveys is what Mary's yeah. saying. You could right, do that. Right. Yeah, you could also do it internally that way. Um, and then, you know, where there may be, um, area, there may be interviews you want to do too, depending yep, on. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 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 I guess the question becomes then, okay, we got the brand attributes part. That's pretty much easy. I kind of thought through that. But when it comes down to whether or not or who, for that fact, uh, should be a part of the the, the uh, building the user personas, who should be part of actually uh, getting down to the goal prioritization, like yeah. how much of that should go past the executive team, I guess. It's a good question, and that depends yeah. on the speed of the project. Mary, you have some thoughts? Well, I, you could have people, you know, you could find out if people are, if if they want to, like ask them if they want to participate in that, you know, start with like asking them, making that an option, an option, and then see how many people you're dealing with, you know? Okay. Yeah, and the, yeah. the way I would do it is I, I would do it in a, in a, for the sake of speed, I'm thinking here efficiency right, right. and product yeah. delivery, is that you would have the internal circle, like an inner circle that participates, mm -hmm. let's say, into setting user personas. Uh, then you actually validate them by putting them out externally for feedback. Um, okay. You know, meaning externally might not ever necessarily be, you know, for if you put them out to the public and then they don't see themselves in them you know, yeah. or or you have to do really good job at doing five or six personas that represent the entire population, yeah. um, which you might not get, but it might be best at the service level since the personas are gonna be critical uh, for the creation of uh, user stories or in the case of set service design, which we use the framework of service design to create our product architecture for the system, which was what do our users need at what point in their careers, right? So what is a person that needs service from the city need, you know, this is persona X, her name is Cindy and she's Cindy Lopez and she's Hispanic and she's a mother of two. What, a, how is she gonna engage with um, the city in what services she needs to engage, right? So you, those are important. Um, and then happy, having those come from the executives at the city, from the, from the leadership, who do you deal with most? Who do you want to deal with? Who are you yeah. missing? Who are you missing in the way that your services are organized right now? And who needs to be included yeah. that you're missing? So you're looking for the gaps, right? Yeah. In the in the delivery of city services, and you need to be very aware of that yourself. Uh, that that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get the people that you already know you're servicing well, and the people that you aren't. So those are the two extremes, and then you right. build personas in the middle. In terms of involvement, I would involve the executive core team, the center, the the leadership team, and then beyond that, just inform people and request feedback. That's the fastest way. If you open those up to the public, well, the one that you could open to the public is, you know, efficiency, right? What services you can do without doing the exercises, you can abstract the needs of the city. And by doing a survey citywide that says, you know, how do our services rate? What do you need more from the city? Here are all the services that we offer. Can you score them in order of priority for you? You know, you're basically doing in software design, this is called a, a uh, primary customer validation uh, or user validation, which is when you make assumptions for the customers and you ask them to confirm them and to prioritize them. That could be a useful tool 
that helps the government engage the community and knowing that, okay, the government is actually working on making this stuff better. Wow, we're impressed. And then they give the input and then you inform them of the progress later and thank them for their participation. Mm. Yeah, awesome. Go ahead, awesome. Mary. I got to add on to the service design piece just a tiny bit because I want to make sure it's super clear. So, um, and when you're when once you have all your research done and you figure it out, some you have some you know theories around what you think you want to design, right? Like what interventions you may want to design and change. Um, you want to make a map probably of. Um, who you're servicing, right? Exactly what Jose was saying. So it's the, you know, the stories become real and they become, you know, this person needs this from the city, right? But then, and that's all the front end, right? Like in software, it's the front end. It's what people experience yep. on, the, uh, in, on the stage, right? But backstage, there's all this stuff that needs to happen to make that thing come true, that design, that service, you know, become reality. And so that's when it's really critical to co-create it, the solution with the people that are backstage, right? The people that are, whose jobs are going to be impacted, whatever change needs to happen in the, or in the city and the organization itself. Mm -hmm. um, all of those stakeholders need to get aligned. And that's, th that, that's the moment, right? It's like, you know, you can't uh, just, like a lot of times I think as designers, we come up, like we naively think, oh, we're gonna, you know, create this amazing experience. And we're just thinking right. about the front end, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's like the implications to everything that needs to be adjusted behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, um, <laughs> you know, and I just one last point, Scola. Um, you know, I had, a, I was able to meet uh, this young woman, Odetta Sampson, she was lead researcher at IDEO Labs uh, and is now uh, one of the lead um, design researchers at IBM. Okay. And we had this conversation about personas and the difference between using personas and actual people, uh, people that you actually know. And she, her preference was uh, whenever you're dealing with policy or products that actually exist and you're not a startup, that you use real customers. Um, she says, especially in policy, because with a real customer, there is a tangibility that happens when you look at that customer's experience. And with policy, you have so many opportunities for, for random occurrences and, 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 and impact uh, that it's important to look at the lifespan of a person in their, you know, in their local municipality. So, you know, that's just my two cents, but... Um, yeah, all of this hopefully was valuable, brother. Yeah, I, I, I think I think all the information that I gathered is great. And I saw that Patricia said that she's taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, guys. She is Miss Efficiency. I, 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 I'm grateful to have her on the team. Uh, so thank y'all. It's awesome. The tribe is awesome. All, always resourceful. So I appreciate it. Thank y'all. Yeah, not a problem. So uh, let's see, it's not, it's 1210. Um, yeah, let's reset the room. Any other questions or getting ready to land the plane? Super grateful and excited to have Samuel and to have Mauro here. Any other questions for them? If, si están en México, si están en Latinoamérica, tienen una oportunidad de preguntarle a Mauro y, a, y, a, y en español si quieren. Yo lo traduzco y a Samuel, cualquier pregunta acerca de, de estrategia. So uh, for the yeah. last five minutes. Yeah. Uh, both have a question in the comments. Uh, can you help me uh, translate? Pape. Uh, yeah. 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 This one right I can, here. I can, yeah, I can read out that. ¿Cómo definieron el modelo para avanzar con la ejecución del proyecto, presupuestos, planning, etc.? Got it. So his question is, um, how did you define the, the working model? Like, how do you define the project management? Uh, to move forward uh, with execution uh, of the execution of the project and how did you do budgets and planning? And this goes um, to the agile agile planning question that somebody asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's actually, I don't, I don't know if it's like a no, no, known answer. We don't really have a specific model. Um, 
at least not, not right now. It's just something that we've been slowly working towards uh, having. And ever since I rebranded the, the the company, now we're starting to uh, set more more like more priorities, more processes, making sure that we have everything in line. Especially specifically as the as the team is is growing right now, um, a lot of these these models need to evolve. Uh, one of the things that we, we used to do, uh, at least what we did with the last campaign and, and the video, right, was that. I, I came up to Samuel and I proposed an, an idea. And he said, okay, that's that's great. What do we do? Look at this part. We look at the, the, the amount of money that we have here or he proposed a new idea. And then uh, when I think to it, it's like a hot potato, right? We take it back and forth and we put it up higher and higher and higher every time. Then we come back to the rest of the team and say, okay, well, what do you guys think? How can we, how can we modify this? How can we change it? How can we make it better? And uh, as that happens, right, we start to really understand timelines and the costs and the uh, time management, right? like everything that needs to happen in order for, for that specific campaign to happen. And we keep it right now super, super flexible, super open. Um, but it's one of the ways that, uh, that we collaborate. And I think it's, uh, it's worked for us because we're so small and so nimble that we can just move really quickly through all these different issues um but definitely you know i think as, as we are growing uh, the team uh yeah it's you need to have a, a very specific model where you can have that, that consistent feedback and you're not sort of screaming at the air and trying to see if we can catch the um so the idea from you know, plug it from the air yeah Samuel, do you have any comments on that or on the hot potato model Yep. Uh, Mary, Mary is CFO. S -s Mary, no, Mary, eh, ella trabaja eh, en el en manejamiento de proyecto, project management, y para cosas creativo, creativas. Pensé, pensé que era CFO y me iba a pegar. No, 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 no te va a pegar, no. <laughs> eh, como te comenté al principio, Corbus empieza por un, por algo muy personal o sentimental de mi parte. Entonces, al principio, la ejecución y el presupuesto, mi cabeza no lo miraba mucho, porque Corbus tenía que salir, porque era para mí algo como revivir a mi hijo. Mm. So, he, at the beginning, uh, Corbus is a very important thing for him because of the story of his son, and he didn't look at budgets and at, you know, those things at the beginning because he had to just make it work. Entonces uno piensa que no importa cuánto vayas a invertir, esto tiene que salir. No matter what he had to invest, you know, it had to come out. Pero te das cuenta que llega un momento donde ningún dinero es suficiente y necesitas hacer un presupuesto. Yeah, there comes a point when, you know, all the money in the world is not enough and you still have to budget. Entonces lo primero que sí que nos tocó hacer es ¿Cuántos eran nuestros, nuestros costos de nómina, rent, gastos fijos, renta, publicidad, eh, mercadotecnia, eh, proveedores? Empezamos a saber cuánto necesitábamos ingresar y de ahí partimos. So the first step was understanding what basic operating expenses were and just baselining that, you know, everything from technology to marketing to, mar uh, you know, and all the expenses, rent. Uh, and then once they knew that, they knew how much revenue they needed to generate. Entonces ya sabíamos cuál en México se dice, bueno, en México en español, eh, punto de equilibrio. Yeah, break even point. Break -even. They needed to figure out what their break even point was. Entonces eso lo el monto del dinero del presupuesto lo pasamos a número de lentes. Got it. So then the 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 number of the total budget uh, and how much they needed to make to break even, they passed that on to how many glasses they needed to sell. Now that gives them a quantitative measure. Entonces descubrimos cuántos lentes necesitábamos vender para poder tener nuestro punto de equilibrio. So now he knew how many glasses they need to sell to get to the break-even point, um, which which is a smart thing. If Pape, how how is this answering questions for you? Like yes, no, yeah, got it. Continúa hasta Okay. okay. Eh, entonces en, con la equipo de mercadotecnia era saber sacar 
cuánto nos costaba el costo por adquisición. So with the team that's doing uh, customer acquisition, it was knowing how much is the cost per customer that they acquire. So they know how many glasses they need to sell, then they know how much it costs to sell one pair. Eh, y de ahí es empezar a jugar con los números y, y hacer el plan y ya pasamos al plan para que ese costo por adquisición irlo cada vez bajando. Yeah, so now from there you actually could plan what you were going to do for acquisitions and the goal became how to reduce the cost of per customer acquisition. So una cosa para, para mencionar or something to mention is that what, what Samuel and what Mauro's talk, what, how Mauro shared it and what Samuel is saying is the process he's going through to get to uh, what he needs and what he has to spend. And Aurelio has another question there. So what's interesting about this and that you should pay attention to it is this is the relationship between a founder and CEO and a designer who's strategic, which is like, Mauro might not understand. Well, he probably understands where he, it's someone who's responsible for coming up with a lot of the budgeting and all those tools. And now Mauro knows a number that he needs to hit in terms of, so the, the, the refinement of the messaging and the refining of the user experience now has a quantitative measure, which is we need to sell these many glasses every month. Where are the friction points? So now you can find the friction points in the whole system. So this is now advanced level, not just core, this is advanced level strategy as a whole and involvement in a business not just being part of like the team who says, oh, I'm going to make it pretty. Now you're involved in the business and you have skin in the game. Uh, Aurelio. Are you on mute or is I'm your muted. mute? I, I, I don't think he took it off. Mute. Oh, wait. Oh, maybe oh, wait. The oh, now we go. Now we can hear you. Hey, you hello. Me? Hello. I hit that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um... I think I'm, I'm asking my, my question like in, in two different perspectives because one, I, I also own my business. So this, what you just answered helps me a lot on my own like startup or entrepreneurial journey. But yeah. also on the other side, as a designer, uh, what my, I think my, my question is like, how, how, what do you, how do you define like the budget for Mauro's strategic work? Because I think that's where it can get complicated. Because I know when you, once you get to the deliverable of core, and then it, I'm not sure if, if Mauro is doing all of the design or he's just managing the the other team. And if that, like, how how did you like say? Do you put a number to that, or then you become a partner of core boost? And I, I'm you, sure you want to know how Mauro is getting paid, basically. Like, yeah, how do yeah. I how do we do a relationship this way with an entrepreneur? that you have a very close relationship. And the first thing I'll say, and I'll let Mauro answer, this is clearly a long-term relationship and there's clearly a, a vested benefit in each other, building each other's, you know, uh, respective who they are as people. Mauro, or, and you guys don't have to share exactly how you're getting paid, but you can also yeah. share like how you figured it out. Yeah, I, I'm actually, Jose, I think you really, I think you answered it as concise as, as well. The best way I could have answered it. Um, yeah, I think this relationship has has uh, is evolved a lot throughout this year and a half, almost two years that we've been working together. Um, I think we started really as a freelance-based uh, project, and then we jumped into something that was just consistent. Um, a retainer. You started as a freelancer with some deliverables yeah. and. And Samuel is like, I don't know, this is, I'm not sure about the strategy thing. This is kind of weird and suspicious, but let's try this guy out. Oh, it's working out. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Let me give you every, yeah. some, every month. That, is that a good, yeah. uh, a good translation of what happened? Yeah, I think there's, there's some mutual, you know, benefit. Uh, we both want to see this company grow. We both are invested into it. Um, we see all the, possi the possibilities of it. And I think that's why, that's why I'm here. Uh, it's because I believe in the vision, I believe in the promise, I believe in, in what this company is doing and what it can stand for. Um, I think someone as well. And this is what has really become like a really great friendship and business partnership. Um, where we're trying to really kind of put this thing into, just push what was into the strategy. And um, is there equity involvement? Yeah. It's like at any, but, but here's the question. What would equity mean in, 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 in is, 
is there a model of companies like Corvus going public in, in, in public markets in Mexico? Somewhere or no? Que si hay modelo que, que eh, compañías como Corvus salen al mercado de, 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 de ¿cómo se dice stock market en español? Eh, a la bolsa de valores o no? ¿Cuáles son los exits? ¿Venta o simplemente operacional? Operar y crecer. Está en mute, Samuel. You're muted, brother. What? Desde que tengo conocimiento, no hay ninguna empresa de lentes, ninguna marca de lentes en México que esté en la bolsa. What, ¿Qué clase de compañías primariamente están en la bolsa de valores en México? Mm. Compañías americanas, internacionales, corporaciones. Construcción, me llama construcción, ah. software. Software, got it, ok, no, hay, no, no está el modelo. Ok, así que el, a largo plazo es la comunidad y es el valor que trae como negocio y, y en general la abundancia que un negocio así puede traer. Que se pueden crecer negocios grandes y no estar públicos, no ser, no ser como en Estados Unidos. Pero um, uh, let me offer a model, but this somewhere. No sé mucho cómo se manejan las empresas uh, en la bolsa. Pero sí sé, por ejemplo, que es una forma de crecer muy rápido. Sí. Uh, Pero no sé hasta qué punto eh, financieramente lo tienes que tener muy bien controlado para salir a la bolsa. Sí, tienen que estar mucho los sistemas en el... Eh, no vamos a hacer ese, ese, ese webinar, una conversación. What do you need to go public? Here's how you do your compliance work. Uh, we're not going to do that. But what I want to just to answer your question, Papa, and then for everyone else who's here, Uh, and then for Shaquille's kind of agile pricing, I'm going to share how we did it as an entrepreneurial uh, startup uh, focused design firm. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's not as complicated as it sounds, but we ended up doing the following. Uh, and Mary, Mary, do you want to say something before I say the agile pricing? No, go ahead, but I can probably add on when you're finished. Perfect. Um, so we would charge a fixed fee for the, disco for the discovery phase. So we, we would charge, you know, and this, this goes to your market. We would charge $50,000 for discovery to a startup. They, they usually had budgets of around $250,000 to $300,000 if they were a funded startup. I always knew that's a number because a funded startup raises two to three million here in the United States at the beginning. If it's seed and they only raise a quarter or less, then that's a little problematic. But that has to do with what size you want to play in. But then if you're in your market, it might be 5,000, you know, 10,000, 20,000 for just the discovery phase. And this is in the United States in dollars, uh, translated to your, to your local market. Uh, and then at the end of the discovery phase, we would do core, we would do product architecture, we would do some preliminary wireframes and ideation during that process. We would almost do an MVP, like a minimal viable product, not in software, but in sometimes we did click through prototypes. Um, there are companies today, like my friend Scott at Philosophy, they build an MVP in software for one in one sprint, in one eight week sprint for like $25,000 or something like that, like, or $30,000. Like they, they do it really fast um, uh, in four weeks even, but eight weeks is usually their, 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 their jam. At the end of that, we would do a planning session where we would work with the engineers, the developers, the designers, the owners, or the CTO and the CEO, you know, in this case. And we would plan out the entire, like, what would it take to build this platform and the software, in this case, a company. And we would estimate, like, what the effort is for each of the tasks uh, underneath each of the objectives or the sections of the software. Y después, después de eso, and after that, we would give a number to the estimate. So you would estimate effort, And then you, there's something called uh, uh, Scrum Poker, which you use numbers to define what is the, the, the effort to hours ratio. Don't, don't think about it, it's too complicated. But once we knew the hours, we would multiply that times our, our, fix, our, our, our blended rate, which at the time was $150 an hour. So if the project says to build this platform is going to be 2,000 um, hours at $150, how much is that? And how long would it take? So then you divide the total, the 2,000 hours. The, the response from the client was usually like, what? This is way too much. So then we would say, let's prioritize what 
features we can get into the budget that you actually have. And that's the way that we dealt with scope creep. Then every sprint, we redid that process and we, we reprioritize. What, what, one example of how we ended up doing that for a project for a nonprofit where they freaked out when it, the project budget came out to like, you know, somebody calculate 2000 times 150, um, $250,000, but they only had a certain amount. We cut everything down with the engineer in the room, the head of the, the owner of our partner, our development partner, who said, okay, we can build that in less time by using this API or by using this module. And we basically refactored the entire solution in the same work session. It was a two day work session. Uh, and then at that point, the client felt, well, we're not getting everything we want, but we're getting everything we need. And we delivered all the things that they wanted too, because at the end of the sprint, there was time left over. Uh, uh, you're inflating the amount of hours all the time. So that's agile pricing. Now that's relatively crazy and complex unless you're building software and unless you know how to use agile, but it's a potential model for how you can work with other people, which is estimate your hours and the things that they have and reprioritize if uh, it doesn't fit into their budget. Uh, Mary, would you like to add a point? And then I'd like to add a point as well. And we need to wrap up after that. And then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really simply, like you, like just make it really simple. You can think about like <clears throat> how much time you have, you know, I mean, it's kind of that, that I actually have it right here on my desk. It's time, scope, money, right? So you have a certain amount of time, the, the client has a certain amount of um, money and they want certain things, right? So uh, what can you, what can you do? Um, what, what agile pricing is really keeping it open, like saying, okay, we're gonna work for this period of time and it's gonna cost this much. And then we're gonna prioritize what we can do in that period of time for that much money, right? So that's, that's really the gist of it. But you don't wanna promise that you're going to deliver anything in um, over that time and month uh, for that money. What you want to do is just point out what they could get, right. and then yeah. and then be be very very careful about the wording of that, <laughs> so that it's about what the, what you could deliver in that time. And then once you actually do the cycle planning, the sprint planning with the with the client, you're able to really get into how much time and effort it's going to take to give them what they want, and you just keep working until you deliver as much as you can. And what you want to show is that you've added that you've um, you want to manage expectations around like um, just like Jose said over delivering. So you want to deliver more value than what they expected. So just be careful with that too. Yeah, you know, um, I'll share this. You know, Mara and I, uh, one of our largest clients, Formosa Group. That's how we uh, manage that client. They had so much work going on. They were a company that was quickly growing. Um, when we started with them, they had two divisions. Um, by the end of the third year of us working with them, they had five divisions. Uh, they were constantly winning awards. They needed magazine, you know, uh, um, uh, awards and they need, you know, constant development behind their branding and marketing. It was an ongoing process to manage them. What we did is we moved them into agile uh, branding, which was we had a retainer on a monthly basis. We knew exactly how many hours we were going to devote to the client. And then based on those hours, we said, okay, what is the work that you need to get done next month so that we can take care of this? And this is the limitation of hours that we can develop specifically to your project. And it was beautiful. Every month, we just worked on a small set of tasks. Sometimes it might be updating one of the websites. Some days it might be doing working on an email newsletter. It might be doing working on a magazine ad for them. It might be doing some product photography for some of their locations. It could be any number of creative tasks, but we always capped it. And we knew that every single month we had this revenue coming in. Um, and we had a relationship um, from growing the business from you know a small one division company to a five division company. So we had a really great relationship with our head of business development. So. Um, and that was a relationship built on trust. Any time there was a new technology or new opportunity, uh, he would give me a call and he said, hey, you know, we've got this new thing coming in or we want to reposition or we want to add this to our service suite. What do you think? Now, that comes from the similar relationship Mato is showing with Samuel. So, um, this is you know, beautiful. We can go on for days because this exactly. is exactly so 
I, I just want to say that I'm extremely grateful. Muchas gracias, Samuel, por, por venir y por compartir con nuestra comunidad. Eh, Mauro nos ha enseñado lo que han estado haciendo en Ensenada y sin llorar aquí eh, 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 es un, un, una, un ejemplo tan bonito de uh, la historia eh, de tu hijo, la historia de cómo tú has traducido esto a un llamado en tu vida a hacer algo creativo, pero también como emprendedor y para darle la oportunidad a un maestro como, como Ma Mauro a, a, a ser tu, tu, tu partner en lo que estás haciendo y, y driven, eh, guiado por la estrategia y por una, un tremendo sentido de calidad y de, 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 de belleza. It's very beautiful, so I'm very grateful for you guys being here. And I'll give it back to you, uh, Keone. So um, what I'd like to do is this, guys. You know, we're going to wrap up right now. Um, but thank you guys all for coming through. Um, as always, Core Office Hours is brought to you by Core's Magic. Um, so if any of the projects that you hear us talking about or in, if, you, if you're on the fence about picking up Core, um, you know, hopefully this has been an opportunity for you guys to learn it and be able to, to apply it. Um, you know, we want to show that there's a community of us that is supporting you guys through this process. It's not just like you buy core um, and then you, you know, we leave you on your loan. We're actually invested in your personal development. It's why we have design therapy. It's why we have core office hours. It's why we've got so much other additional content that we've got in the pipeline just for you guys, uh, because we're seriously invested in your success. Uh, so check us out. We're all over the interwebs. Um, you can check us out on Instagram or Twitter. Um, we are the system, no E, uh, and Jose Caballero, Keone Chong, and Mary A. Gribbon uh, use hashtags Core is Magic, and we are the system. Um, if this is the first time checking us out, we invite for you guys to check us out on uh, and join the Core Tribe. Uh, we've got a Facebook group, and it's our brand strategy foundation. It's updated from fundamentals. Um, and, and as always, we invite you to like and subscribe. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, Mauro, can we have Mauro share uh, the yeah. Instagram for Corvus and also what, ¿Dónde podemos hallar a Corvus online? Um, oh, Samuel. El botoncito está por ahí, lo puedo hacer yo de este lado. Ah, mira aquí. A veces se pierde el botoncito. Ah. En lentescorbus.com. Y si vienen a Ensenada, pues en Ensenada y próximamente estamos en el proyecto para abrirlo en Tijuana en verano. Beautiful. Ok, yo, eh, José, quiero sí. entender, todos los que están, estamos aquí en la sala, la gran mayoría son diseñadores. Sí. Ok, eso está interesante. Mm, ¿Por qué? Desde el punto de vista cuando uno busca a un diseñador es necesito que me haga un, un flyer no sé si mm. quieres traducirlo yeah what well, the point of view it, he's, it's very interesting that we're all designers well there's scientists here and there's a few other people but uh and artists and, and illustrators etc but his point is that when you're looking for a designer you think i need a designer to make a flyer for me okay o, o, o un poco de papelería mm -hmm. or a letterhead pero creo que con Mauro y me imagino que todos ustedes me permití conocer a la nueva generación de diseñadores. That with Mauro and with all of you, I am allowing myself to meet a new generation of designers. Porque ya hoy yo me pude dar cuenta que ya no es una persona que hace un flyer o te hace un papel. Because I've been, no, I've noticed now, I know now that it's not just somebody who does a flyer or, or does a letterhead for you. Porque ustedes tienen o irán desarrollando la habilidad que yo a Mauro siempre le digo. That you guys are or are developing the ability that I always tell Mauro. Entrar en mi cabeza. To come, to come into my head, into this crazy in here. Yo soy ingeniero, mi cabeza es muy... Números, unos, ceros, abstracto. I'm an engineer, so my head is all zeros and ones. It's all very abstract. 
pero la nueva generación de diseñadores es poder entrar a la cabeza del, del empresario y entender realmente qué es lo que quiere hacer. So the new generation of designers has the ability, you guys have the ability to come into my head and understand what it is that we have to create. Y lo más valioso es que puedan ir tirar la piedra aún más lejos de lo que el empresario quiere. And the most valuable thing is actually to be able to throw the vision out way farther than I was even thinking as an entrepreneur. Entonces, esos son ustedes, la nueva generación de diseñadores. And that's you guys, the new generation of core masters. You have the ability to understand him, to make his vision a reality, and you have the ability to send it out further. Pape talks about this all the time with his clients, that they thought they wanted to do this, but Pape's like, no, we're going to do this. And that ability to provide that long-term vision, that horizontal vision, what Keone calls the infinite game, is an ability that isn't, hasn't been in the hands of us as creators, as creatives, ever in the history of 20th century, you know, commercial, commerce and, 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 and entrepreneurship. And that's really what we've been trying to, this is the real purpose of me starting the school. It, it, it wasn't just so that you can learn to run your businesses better. It's so that you can contribute to the creation of the future in collaboration with other people like engineers, you know, not being afraid of, you know, Samuel's brain of numbers and expectations, not being afraid of expectations, knowing that you are powerful as you are in your ability to listen and translate. Remember, my name is Joseph. In the Bible, the story is that Joseph heard the king's dream, right? Through one of his co-prisoners and he interpreted for them. That's, <laughs> dime, someone? Yo soy cristiano y sé perfectamente que es José. So we are translators of the king's dreams and we're also kings and queens. So we then work with each other to translate each other's dreams and to make each other's dreams come true. And the way we do that is through core. And how, that's how we build abundance and that's how we build a new world is by partnering with entrepreneurs, partnering with people that are innovative and they're innovating in Latin America and Africa and Europe and wherever it might be here in the United States. Skola is a great example of that happening with someone in the Philippines all over the world we can do it and and that's really our role so samuel is acknowledging that he's among a new tribe of people so we we acknowledge your acknowledgement and thank you so much for that gracias a ustedes for su tiempo muy bonito keone what key takeaways let's do it we're, we're a little bit behind so the rule is if you need to leave please go uh if you have meetings if you have lunches to go to gracias samuel gracias mauro but ahora vamos a hacer un poco de upload, which is, um, what did you take away from this conversation? Keone, let me shut up and you do it. Yeah, you know, for me, it, it wasn't something that was a key takeaway as more as a key reinforcement. And that is that relationships, uh, they take time and they're built with trust. Um, and when you can enter into true collaboration, there is a release. There is no like ownership over the idea. There is just, we have a shared vision and we're pushing towards that goal however it's manifested, um, you know, Samuel and, you know, his ability to release ownership to model and model's ability to release ownership of the idea to just translate. Um, and, you know, they have this beautiful friendship and relationship um, that's reflected in the work, right? You see this high fidelity, high quality, beautiful design. And when you look at it and you're like, well, is it strategy? Well, yes, it's strategy, but it's more than that. It's also collaboration. And so that's my takeaway. Mm. Can, I, can I share something? Please. I just wanted to say that um, I feel so grateful for all of you because during the Black Friday sale, I only bought core. I didn't know that it comes with a tribe. And so... <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, um, I've been here consistently for a year and I just wanted to be um, to say thank you to everybody. Um, like what Scala sh shared, can you imagine a Filipina from Manila can hopefully after it's signed that wishing and praying that we'll be managing a city branding project remotely and I'm here on lockdown with all the craziness. So it's because of all of you. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Patricia. I am Patricia. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and one key takeaway, it's something that Samuel mentioned, and is that 
like it, working with core and strategy here in Latin America, it definitely like I, I know people pay for discovery in in US and it's like a big thing. For, but here, like it, it tends to be complicated. That's why for me, how I do it is 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 just part of my creative process. I don't work without core. And that way, if someone comes for a logo, I'm just indirectly opening up the, the door to some something else. And the reason I asked the question on how to work on the execution is because it, it does, it, it's intimidating, but I believe that after you go through like the, the first discovery and you start seeing the execution getting done and, and seeing the results, because it's, it's tangible, like you, you can start seeing how the social media improves how people start relating better to your brand and eventually that translates into sales and 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 like it, it's not easy in latin america but i think now we're in a shifting point where for example e-commerce in panama it's something that is new it's starting and and that's like a really big opportunity to start like opening up and helping people like achieve their goals because we're just creative sherpas I, I have my, 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 my artistic view and what I, my purpose of what I want to achieve in the world. But when I'm a designer, I'm just in service to the client. And, I, and as, as Samuel was saying, is about understanding and coming in alignment with their vision and make it happen. So, yeah, that's, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Pape. You know, you brought up a really interesting point about you know, whether you sell your discovery process or not, um, you know, there's, it's important to understand that where you are in your creative journey. Um, and generally speaking, uh, I think that you get up to a point where you're comfortable selling discovery as its own thing outside of your deliverable when you've like built up enough expertise, you know, like when you're first starting out, you know, when you're just getting into the, to the swing of things, I've used it and Jose has seen me use it. I've used uh, discovery as a sales tool to actually get the client, right? So it's a tool that can be wielded in a number of different ways. And as you get comfortable with it, then you can start to leverage it in a ways where you can use it like almost as its own deliverable, you know? So for the, those of you that see folks saying like, oh, well, I sell strategy for X number amount of dollars. And yeah, that's great. You can totally do that, but that doesn't mean that you have to do that right out of the box. Yeah. And you know, just use it as a tool to get familiar with before you uh, and build up the expertise. It's okay to do it for free for 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 certain people or for for your friends. Exactly. Uh, for your yeah. friends' businesses, I've done core for my brother's farm. You know, for mm -hmm. somebody's, you know, you know, somebody just for even personal development, just for helping leaving people's personal core in my life, and it it, it all pays off because you're building the realities of other people's lives. Uh, over and over and over again and the more you do it the more you have the stories in your head and the more companies that you know how to like help and guide that means that you can now masterfully facilitate and see you know how to give shape to any idea so yeah it's beautiful thank you all can i say something yes por favor, yes, yes. yes. Hey, i i i want to compliment what you say building the i mean building creativity building the history of the people so um I'm using core to open the first meeting, you know, to understand what how people is doing, what they are dealing, and I'm trying to focus core also in, in the goals of this decade, what does mean sustainability and innovation and to change the system. So I'm mm -hmm. trying really to to mix core with the new era, with the new generations, with the new thinking and working in human-centric culture. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, I'm doing very well. So I'm, um, I mean, it's very welcome because it's a way to touch the person. Mm -hmm. And people always want to, to want to say something, want to change something as Samuel Cruz, want to build something. So they need really uh, to have an interactive person, not only thinking in numbers, but thinking in the big system, in the big ecosystem. And what if, if you guys don't know what Hania is doing, she's bridging the gap between Latin America and Germany uh, when it comes to science, innovation, and agribusiness, and technology inside Latin America. So she's educating Latin American entrepreneurs in how to build 
their businesses and their ideas instead of depending on jobs or on governments for their funding. So it's a huge, huge outcome. Uh, and But it's a beautiful starting point to bringing strategic thinking, design thinking, and it, uh, entrepreneurship to Latin America in the form of science. I love Mario, man. Taitos has Mario's going, which is beautiful. Thank you, Hanya, for that. And um, let's, uh, Keone, will you just, you know, take it away with your final thinking, final thoughts on collaboration for this week? And then we'll do cookies and like everybody can chat if they want to and stay, stick around. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about the theme of this week, which is collaboration. And, you know, today we've got a wonderful, uh, a wonderful model of that. Um, between two folks that are within our community. And, you know, we're just super, super grateful for you guys being open and sharing your stories, Samuel and Maro. Um, you know, I just want for us to understand that, you know, collaboration is a huge, huge component of how we work um, and, you know, how we're going to design, you know, our ideal lives. And, uh, you know, we are all in one way or another in branding as a creative, whether you're a thinker or a builder. And, you know, we have to prioritize healthy collaboration. And uh, for those of you that are new to this concept, I hopefully this is gonna, you know, shift your thinking and move you in the right way. Uh, for those of you that are experienced in this, I hope that you guys can at least pull a couple tidbits or principles from our conversation that you guys can apply to your lives. But um, collaboration is the future. Healthy collaboration is the future. And uh, with that, you know, we're gonna end on that note. So cheers, y'all. Much love. Thank you for hanging with us. We ran a little bit long. It was a juicy topic, but uh, lots of value in this one. Peace out. Hasta la próxima. Nos vemos pronto. Mucho amor. <laughs>